Good afternoon. My name is Travers. I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Simon Fraser University. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome you to hear Dr. Ronaldo Walcott, Professor, Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. The title of his talk will be The Caribbean Sea in Canada, Notes on Tributaries. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge that Simon Fraser's three campuses are located on the unceded, indeed stolen territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Coquitlam, Kwantlam, Semiamu, and Tuasin peoples. For those of you needing closed captioning, there's a button at the bottom of the screen that says live transcript. You can enable the closed captioning by selecting that button, then clicking the up arrow on the button and selecting view full transcript. Let me tell you how this event is going to run. In a moment, I will be introducing my colleague, Dr. Maureen Kahika, who will be introducing Dr. Walcott. Dr. Walcott will deliver his talk, and then we will have some time for Q&A. Because this is a webinar, it will be necessary for you to type questions that you have for Dr. Walcott into the Q&A, which should be located on the bottom of your screen as it is on mine. You can type questions into the Q&A tab at any time during the lecture. And Dr. Kahika and I will be taking turns selecting questions from that list. I'd like to let you know that this talk is being recorded and will be available on our department website in the coming weeks. When the talk is available, we'll be sending out an email to all the attendees. I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Now I wish to introduce Dr. Maureen Kahika, um, Assistant Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology here at SFU, who will share a few remarks as she introduces Dr. Walcott. Awesome. Thank you so much, Travis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maureen Kahika, and I am an Assistant Professor in the Sociology Department and Labor Studies Program. I am honored to have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Rinaldo Walcott, professor in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. Professor Walcott's research is in the area of Black diaspora cultural studies, gender and sexuality. Professor Walcott has published many works, among which include the 1997 bestseller, Black Like Who, Writing Black Canada, with a second revised edition of this title in 2003. I initially came across Professor Walcott's work early on during my graduate school education, inspiring me to reflect on Black Canadian culture, Canadian Blackness, in the context of its erasure and diasporic dispersals. Most recently, Professor Walcott's works include On Property, written as a pamphlet discussing radical abolition and in particular, the historical unfinished project of abolition for Black people. Professor Walcott's other works include Black Life, Post BLM, and the Struggle for Freedom, in which he conceptualizes Black embodiment, Black flesh as a site on which violence is enacted and subsequently denied in the foundation and the making of the Canadian nation state even at a post-Black Lives Matter era. This work insists, indeed makes the demand that Black life be a full life, despite the resistance by social forces, structures, and people that it be something less than a full life. Published by Duke University Press to be released this April, Professor Walcott's work, Long Emancipation, Moving Toward Black Freedom, unpacks and challenges the idea of emancipation, inviting us to contemplate, quote unquote, the question, why and how Black people do not have something called freedom. This afternoon, Professor Walker's presentation is titled, The Caribbean Sea in Canada, Notes on Tributaries. It is an extended mediation on the relationship between Canada and the Caribbean, drawing on historical evidence and Walcott's own impressionistic reading of that evidence as a theorization of the long relations between white Canada and the Caribbean 
In this respect, the presentation focuses on Canada's role in Atlantic slavery as constitutive of how Black people in Canada are presently understood as a national antagonism, offering us a different way to think about the long history of anti-Black racism and its current manifestations in Canada. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ronaldo Walcott. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kihika, um, for that lovely introduction and for saying those kind words about my work. Thank you, Professor Travers, um, for leading the invitation to have me come and speak to your community. Um, it's an honor to be able to do so. And so thank you to the audience and to the members of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology for inviting me to FSU. Um, yeah, I'm going to get right into my talk and I apologize if it's repetitive. This is literally the first draft, um, but, this, but it's drawing from ideas that I've been working with for a while. This invitation has allowed me the opportunity to bridge a very old project, a old project on Black Canadian studies that I had somehow abandoned and a new project that I'm working on, which is a project about thinking about seas and thinking about the sea as constitutive of uh, Black modernity and questions of freedom. So let me get into it. At Cape Negro, northeast of Port Latute, the voice of the sea was strong that night. Sylvia D. Hamilton and I alone escaped to tell you. The ocean, like the Lord and the devil, gives and takes away its memory. Julie DeSille, eat salt, gaze at the ocean. Hundreds of years after, making, after the making of its neo origins, these Canadians and Americans who police these fresh borders, materially as well as intellectually, play and dwell in the same language of conquest. Dion Brand, a map to the door of no return. In 1992, I was in graduate school when the cod fishery on the east coast of Canada collapsed. For years prior to the collapse, I would read newspaper and listen to television reports and even hear family members in the Caribbean complain about the escalating cost of salted cod and its simultaneous scarcity. I vividly recall from that time discussing the elements, the evidence, the, sorry, the events of the day with my graduate school peers. And one of them in particular, Patricia Malloy, who was from out east, she and I threatened to co-write a paper thinking about the impact of the cod fisheries in the two regions and what cod meant for those cultures. You see, salted cod has, a lo has, has long been a tributary for what is now called Canada. At least to the Anglo to at least the Anglo Caribbean, both tied together by British colonization and its practice of black slavery on plantations and beyond. In 1992, when then Fisheries Minister John Cosby announced the two-year moratorium, which was later extended on the cod fishery in Canada, you would have no clue of the long and painfully intimate history that this fish held to the multiracial Caribbean, but especially its Black descendants there and here. The evidence of the long, brutal intimacy is available to us, for us to see and to take account of if we care to do so. But generally, most in Canada remain indifferent to it. The region of Canada, the East Coast that provided the cod for those enslaved on the plantations in the Caribbean, is a region that also has a deep relationship to rum and molasses, but sugarcane does not grow there, the chief element for making molasses and rum. The rum culture of the East of Canada holds its relation to the colonial profit-making exchange of cod for sugar, molasses, and rum, a trade that could only be fully understood through the historical processes of Black people's subjection and enslavement. So they love their rum out East, and they also simultaneously claim to know nothing of slavery. Of course, the overconsumption of rum can produce momentary memory problems, 
but I don't think that is exactly what is going on. As a child in Barbados, Canada and things Canadian were everywhere. Certain elements of the society were saturated with Canada. For at least three to four years on my way to school, the bus went by the McGill University Marine Research Center on the west coast of the island on my way, on my way to, the, to a school in the north. I never understood fully what the Marine Center did, and I have over the years refused to research what it did too. The Marine Center was not very different for me from the many Canadian banks that dotted the landscape or the stories of men leaving to pick fruits for months at a time in Niagara and the stories of women going off to take care of children in Canada. Canada was ever present in a range of ways. As an undergraduate student at York University, I would come to learn that what was initially called the Farm Workers Program and the Domestic Scheme Program were both pioneered in coordination with governments of Caribbean nations. These temporary migration programs, now generally named as temporary workers programs, began with the exportation of Black people from the Anglo-Caribbean to Canada. But to emphasize the point here is that is that the coming of is that coming of age in Barbados, Canada was dotted everywhere in the landscape from banks to marine research to religious missionaries and on and on, even a high school headmaster. Most spectacularly as a memory for me was the drilling in school of the geography of and the study of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. We had to learn the geography of the region by rote. Thus it has always been curious to me that Canadians seem to only know sea, sun and sand of the Caribbean, even as even as Canadian extraction from the region was helping to create their lives. This space between what we in the Caribbean knew of Canada and what Canada and Canadians claim to not know has fascinated me all these years. In fact, one might discern that there's something strange in Canada's denials, something that threatens the psychic life of the nation. In, a, nation. in acknowledging this relationship to and with Black people, Canada might have to come clean about a much longer, more intimate, and dare I say, a more brutal relationship that fractures the multicultural fantasy of its imaginary. Indeed, it is my contention that Blackness shapes the racial unconscious of white Canada, and is in part why Black people are so violently apprehended and interdicted within the boundaries of Canada's geography. I have previously argued Canada's colonial project exists well beyond its geography. It is this extension that I will call tributaries that lead to the Caribbean Sea also existing in Canada. To make the claim of the Caribbean Sea in Canada is to write as if physical geography does not matter. And that is the furthest from my intention. Rather, I am playing with metaphor and the, and the repress as both produce and make the social appear, an anti-Black racist social. This paper then is an extended meditation on the relationship between Canada and the Caribbean, drawing on the trace of historical evidence and an impressionistic reading of that evidence, the paper theorizes the long relations between white Canada and the Caribbean. The paper makes a case that Blackness in Canada is not simply denied because of racism, but rather that Canada as a geopolitical entity does not exist outside of the terrible history of the Caribbean Sea. Linking Canada and the Caribbean firmly through the seas, Caribbean Sea, Atlantic Ocean, and other bodies of water like the St. Lawrence River or Seaway, and the people and commodities that move back and forth across those waters. The paper attempts to join other accounts of Canada's role in Atlantic slavery and its afterlife as constitutive upon Canada are presently understood as a national antagonism, a term antagonism that I'm borrowing from Frank B. Wilson, and therefore to open, uh, open up to brutal forms of violence. I argue that Black people function in the Canadian national psyche like a bad object choice. This paper is not a work of history, but draws on trace and, on, and, and my impressions of the historical to offer a different way to think about the long history and the current manifestations of anti-Black racism in Canada.
Caribbean intellectuals and artists living in Canada have long made the link between Canada and the Caribbean present in their work. I have often turned to Lillian Allen's poem, I Fight Back, in my work to make the link. Allen's still powerful and relevant poem dramatizes and concretizes the, tr the kind of trace and impression of history that I am working with. Allen encapsulates the history in a few pithy lines. ITT, Alcan, Kaiser, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. These are privileged names in my country, but I am illegal here. I scrub floors, serve bakras meals on time, spend two days working in one and 12 days in a week. Here, here I am in Canada bringing up someone else's child while some else and me in absentee bring up my own. In the poem, Alan names the history of mineral extraction and banking, as well as the domestic scheme program as framing Black Caribbean experience in Canada. And she limbs the outsideness imposed on Black people as, but I am illegal here. What, Alan poem offer, what Alan's poem offers us is a tight electric analysis of the relationship between Canada and the Caribbean. What is often forgotten in conversations about Black people in Canada is the marine orientation of the encounter. That is how the sea, lakes, and oceans bind Black and white colonial Canadian histories together. And it is, and, and it is that maritime repression that oriented repression that orients my thoughts today. I'm not simply invoking the seas as geography, but rather what the seas and oceans have wrought for Canada and how when blackness is considered, something else emerges that allows us to comprehend Canada's antagonistic relationship to blackness. This maritime unconscious that I'm seeking to unveil takes many forms, routes and routes. I could trace the St. Lawrence Seaway to the Atlantic Ocean and then into the Caribbean Sea, where many tributaries would reveal Canada's slave consciousness in the colonial period. Or I could take the same route and unravel Canada's history of bauxite extraction in Jamaica and Guyana, linking Montreal and Quebec to maritime Black Atlantic commodity circulations beyond salted cod. Such so links would reveal why Montreal was once the Black Mecca in Canada until the 1960s and 70s language crises pushed Black English speakers to Toronto and other places. These histories are histories of the water, of what floated us here, when and how. And these histories tell a story of Canada's connection to the Caribbean Sea and of the Caribbean Sea in Canada, even if the, the physical geography does not have them immediately meet. The maritime consciousness of Canada is suffused with this history. But let me be clear, I'm less interested in the historical veracity of my claims, even though I know these claims to be founded in a certain empirical reality, and more concerned with the trace and how the trace reveals the unconscious and conscious center of an anti-Black antagonism in Canada. Indeed, a secondary element of what, I'm going to of what I'm going to suggest is that as the field of Black studies takes hold in Canada, at least in its Anglo institutions, that the repressed anti-Blackness of the national white psyche will continue to reveal its violent orientation to Black people and Blackness more broadly defined. Significantly, in Quebec, the unconscious belligerent response to Blackness is already the haunted presence of Nigarok, the desecrated slave cemetery in St. Armand, the ghosts of Marie Joseph Angelique, the St. Lawrence Seaway and its history of trade, and the St. George Williams affair, to name but a few. I should also be clear that I don't fall on the fall for the false separation between Canada and Quebec. So I invoke all of this as Canada all of it as belonging to a maritime Atlantic history suffused with slavery and intent on psychically repressing it. So I am less interested in proving the empirical reality of what we all already know, that slavery was practiced in the geography of Canada and more interested in pointing to how slavery shapes what we call Canada, how slavery lives in its veins its unconsciousness as a nation, state, and people. <laughs>
So let me return to the east of Canada then. Yes. So let me return to the east of Canada then. The artist Camille Turner returns us to seas differently, or should we say bodies of water? Turner's work and that's what Roger Simon called a pedagogy of witnessing in her art making. In a recent project at the 2019 Bonavista Biennale, stage at Mock Beggar Plantation site, and the name is in, in, important to what I think Turner is doing. Turner staged a multi-genre performance and video engagement with early Canada, Canada's role in transatlantic slavery. Turner's re-encounter with Canadian slavery through shipbuilding in Newfoundland is a particularly important example of what Kamal Brathwaite and Edward Gleeson have termed submerged and submerged and submarine memories and cultures of Black diasporic people. Turner's art returns these memories for Black people and in so doing un reveals the unconscious antagonism that shapes and frames Blackness in the white, in the white Canadian consciousness. The return is not merely one of a lost archive. It is a return that forebodes so much more. The somewhat known and acknowledged history of Newfoundland's relationship to slavery often begins and ends at the trade in salted cod and rum. But Turner shifts us to the ship, slave ship building of that economy too. of that economy too. Shipbuilding does not just add to what we know. Shipbuilding reveals how repression works because shipbuilding makes the knowledge of the black cargoes intended for the holes of those ships present. A ghostly presence, as Avery Gordon would put it. It is this enduring presence that, that the Canadian national psyche seeks to irre irrevocably repress. And as a report of Turner's work stated, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians hold the salt cod and shipbuilding heritage up high, immortalizing it in songs, stories, and museums. <clears throat> the article for the states quoting Turner, quote, I'm not here to blame. What my intent is, is to really honor the people who were made invisible by the writing of history and writing them out. Turner's practice then enacts a coming to terms with, and most importantly, a working through. Went too far. Okay. Camille Turner calls her work the Afronautic Research Lab and describes it as a counter archive, countering what is presented as truth. And the lab is a mobile collection of documents, books, and other materials that highlighted connections to slavery that have mostly been shoved aside in Canada. And that was the first slide that I showed you. The lab is a kind of a sonora riff on history as genre and the work that art can do. By placing slavery so firmly back in the contemporary memory of East Coast Canadians, Turner's work can begin a process of returning the repressed psychic life of Marantiners to one in which their full history as Atlantic subjects might be grappled with. The thing, about the thing about the unconscious is that it does not just repress, but the repression functions to continually reveal that which is repressed. That other tributary called the tongue is the pathway to how black blood courses through the veins of white Canada. The rum of out east, the sugar of red path, and the whiskey of Seagram's, Seagram's didn't only just do whiskey, but they imported rum from the Caribbean, are the par parapraxis of the Canadian national imaginary. The question of taste is the historically constituting element here. The candle might be understood to be partially built on the ruins enacted by transatlantic slavery. It's not the way in which the country generally understands itself. It is important, my argument though, that not only it is, but that central to Canada's national imaginary is the repression at the same time 
as it finally transfers its internalized blackness to the USA. One could almost turn to the large body of work by Sylvia Hamilton here as well. Um, and here I offer you two images from a group show that Sylvia Hamilton was in um, at the ROM um, a couple of years back in 2018. Um, Hamilton does not just remind us of slavery. She gives us the names, the record, the materiality of the resources that made it possible. Multiculturalism as policy was supposed to solve the problem of how Canada might situate Black people in its national imaginary. Multiculturalism sought to amend the founding narrative by inviting contemporary Black people across their various histories of arrival into the nation. The myth of the two original peoples found in George Grant's lament for a nation, who in his nationalist and ethnocentric fears he termed French and Catholic, British and Protestant, united precariously in their desire not to be a part of the great republic. But their reasons were quite different, end quote, nonetheless remains intact today despite multiculturalism. So while Grant is defending Canadianness vis-a-vis -vis his disdain for something called the USA, his defense, his lament, consecrates the myth of the founding as the nation as only white. Now we can also read Grant's fear of the USA as also steeped in the fear of how blackness in the US occupies a certain contestatory space vis-a-vis -vis whiteness. One way Grant's lament works is to rhetorically deny blackness historical space in Canada. Grant's lament is a repression. We can, we can count to Grant's lament with a novel like Mary of Sarsfield's No Crystal Stair, Stairs or Oscar Peterson's Body of Musical Work or Carrie Bess's Activism or Cecil Foster's novel Slam and Tar, all pointing to forms of blackness that work against the infrastructure of the kind of memory and imaginary that Grant insists on. By this, I mean that Peterson, Sarsfield, Foster and Bess all offer accounts of blackness in Canada that exceed and thereby render visible Canada's Atlantic and thus slave conscious, consciousness. These works, to the, these works then to reveal the antagonism that shapes contemporary Black life in Canada. But let's just look at this from a different vantage point. In two articles published in the Starbuck News in their diaspora column, you see Elliot historian, cultural critic, and Black Canadian scholar Peter James Hudson responded to the 2008 two-year sponsorship of one of the largest carnivals in the world, the once called Caribana, by Scotiabank for a measly 250,000 Canadian dollars. In Hudson's critique, in his critique, Hudson reminds us of the founding of Scotia Bank, and he writes, and I quote, Scotia Bank has stated that their sponsorship of Caribana continues this long history of investment in the Caribbean. Founded in 1832 in Halifax as the Bank of Nova Scotia, the bank's profits initially came from the maritime trade in cod, sugar, molasses, and rum between Canada and the West Indies. In 1889, it opened its first offices in the region in Kingston and rapidly asserted itself as the British colony's most influential financial institution. It is this history that I invoked earlier through Allen's poem, I Fight Back. Hudson goes on to document how in the bank's newsletters, it reproduced stereotypes of of quote, the majority of Jamaicans are quote, born gamblers who were quote, too lazy to work with at least one writer adding that the Jamaican Negro will not work as long as he has money. Hudson further punched out that quote, it took the bank close to a century to hire its first Jamaican born general manager. 
prefer instead to get the administrative jobs to Canadian born red white staff, end quote. Hudson is writing of 19, 1908 and 1938. But of course, these Canadian banks have a long continuous history in the region, a history that has continually reproduced forms of racism and discrimination. Um, and here I give you from 2010, um, two views of signs outside um, banks in Barbados, um, the Bank of Nova Scotia in Barbados, no sunglasses, no helmets, no hats when entering the bank. And these signs were posted and insist and practices insisted upon because there had been a few bank robberies. Um, we've never seen signs like those in Canada when banks are robbed. Um, this is the, the consciousness of Canadian banking and its extraction in the Caribbean. Hassan has written extensively about US banking in the Caribbean. And his deeply rich study of that history is found in Bankers and Empire, which is largely silent on Canada. However, the essay Imperial Designs, the Royal Bank of Canada in the Caribbean, which he published in 2010, he offers an account of the Royal Bank and its expansion into the Caribbean as an element of the British Empire. In my previous engagement with Huston's work, I have argued that he provides us the historical resource to make sense of how Canadian companies have been extractive companies in the Caribbean region. But more importantly, Hudson's studies of Canadian banking help us to make sense of and understand how Canada's colonial practices exist well beyond its borders. Hudson writes of the Royal Bank archives that, and I quote, the near total restriction on public access to the bank's archives in suburbs of Toronto ensure it is a history that cannot be, be told in its entirety, end quote. Once we come to terms with this simple point, we begin to, be more, to more seriously account for how blackness is constitutive of Canada's national imaginary. Hudson further states in recounting the colonial history of the Royal Bank in the 1970s, quote, the Royal Bank acted in the name of Canada it also assumed a paternalistic, if admittedly second tier role within the British empire, providing the financial services and in some cases colonial monetary functions that would uphold an inter-imperial financial and commercial architecture, end quote. It is reckoning with this repressed national history and imaginary one deeply and persistently haunted by Black people and Blackness that might allow us to make better sense of the contemporary antagonisms faced by Black people in colonial Canada and contemporary Canada, regardless of our numbers. These histories reveal Canada's formation as centered in the slaveholding Atlantic world, plantations or not. It nonetheless inhabits the, log the logics of its founding. So I want to recount two moments from Hudson's article that are pertinent to my arguments around repression. First, Hudson writes of the British West Indies trade deals with Canada of 1912, 1920, and 1927. And he suggested that these deals were in part the groundwork for annexation, an idea that existed in Canada since the 1880s. Hudson points out we all know, Hudson points out what we all know, that annexation did not occur. He then quotes from historian Robin Winks, quote, the idea of Canada West Indian Union founded on three rocks of race. That is the Canadian fear of black West Indian migration, public indifference and British opposition, end quote. Second, Hudson knows that in the era of structural adjustment, the 90s and early 2000s in the global South, including the Caribbean, the Royal Bank with partially withdrew from the region. But by 2007, with Canada under the leadership of Stephen Harper, the Royal Bank became, quote, the fourth largest bank in the region and the second largest bank after Scotia Bank in the Anglo-Caribbean. These two points taken together do not only provide an empirical index for ongoing and sustained extraction, they also provide evidence of the psychic life of Canada's national relations. 
Indeed, the perpetual winter fantasy of Canada, quote unquote, owning a Caribbean island has a history to it. It is a kind of national power praxis. What is more important for me in turning to these kinds of evidence is to set up some conditions, provocations, and cautions as Black studies unfolds in higher education. If Black studies do something more than other kinds of studies, it will have to do more than expand national concerns, fill in what was missing, add to what already exists, and so on. Black studies will have to undo and reconstruct the very terms of knowledge that makes Canada intelligible. It is this radical reordering of knowledge that would allow us to see the recent investments by Canadian banks in Black communities and young Black people in particular cannot ever account for the long extractive practices enacted on the region that fuels Canada's modern development. Indeed, these piecemeal investments occluded a much more difficult and racist history there and here that requires accounting for. If calls for reparations are all the rage, then Canadian banks and mining companies to name but two should populate these lists of those required to make payments as well. The work of Black studies orienting knowledge, reorienting knowledge, I'm sorry, will go a long way in making such claims not only possible, but reparative beyond the economic imperative. What I'm actually plotting here for you is that Canada as a nation form and all of its institutions are deeply implicated in the production of Black life as a less than life, not just recently, but in the long jury of colonial formation that gives rise to the modern state. Once understood in this fashion, the denial of slavery, the acknowledgement of longstanding Black communities across the country, the post-World War II migrations and more recent migration all become a part of the same story of British and French colonial expansion in the Americas and the white supremacist logics that flow from that expansion. Contemporary eruptions of anti-Black racism then are not so much new as they represent the return of the repressed, but the repressed that was never actually fully repressed. I could have sketched the story of the Black Biners out East from the late 19th century or the turn of the 20th century, or similarly for the Black Perrys, or I could have drawn on East Angler's scholarship and reportage and his consistent unraveling of Canada's foreign policy in Haiti and Africa and its mining interests. The point here is not so much the story as it is what these stories reveal about both the material and the psychic life of the nation. And following from that, it suggests that what Black studies might do in Canada is something much big, therefore much bigger than simply adding content. What I'm attempting to do here is to draw on the history of Atlantic commodity trade founded in Black enslavement to make a case for Canada as a part of an Atlantic anti-Black world, even if, slavery, even if slavery supposedly never occurred in its geography, as some white Canadians like to pretend. Some years prior, the, the professor and curator Andrea Fatona curated an exhibition called Reading the Image, for which I wrote a catalog essay entitled Salted Cod, dot, 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 ellipsis. It was my way of consistently demonstrating two things. One, the influence of Black British scholarship on my thinking. In that case, it was Paul Gilroy's essay, The Sugar You Stir, and Stuart Hall's comments on, 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 on England and tea. And two, more importantly, it was the method of reading that both Gilroy and Hall used to return to the conversation the expansive work that noticing the roots of the commodities and their place in the culture did to read it to a reading of Britain as a nation. In that essay, Salted Cod, I pointed out the salted cod and the rum furnished a Black history of Canada that we had simply not contended with, but has instead been left dormant in favor of more recent multicultural and immigrant narratives, now patched up by filling in other long-standing Black communities in Nova Scotia, the Paris, 
at BC and Ontario. So let me return to salted cod one last time. Salted cod, as asserted before, brings Canada firmly and intimately into the circulations of colonial, imperial, and modern histories implicating in the making of the Black diaspora. It is my argument that salted cod might be one of the most interesting and figurative symbols of the relationship of Blackness to Canadianness. Modified though it was, when shipped to Africans who had been made into slaves in the Caribbean, salted cod became a staple in Caribbean diets before Canadians, before Canadians mismanaged the fisheries and salted and turned salted cod into a delicacy, almost making it the preserve of the racially hierarchical Caribbean middle and upper classes. In taking salted cod as one moment where Canada's borders of blackness extend beyond the geogra geographic limits of the nation state proper, we also encounter a silence or a repression simultaneously. Such a reading practice allows us to read the ways in which the appearances and disappearances of Blackness and Black people in the project of the Canadian nation state signify both historically and contemporarily. That is what I'm calling an antagonism, an antagonism that is a deathly one too. So the death of the cod fishery is symptomatic of the ways in which Blackness and Black people haunt the Canadian nation state. That is Black Black deaths and disappearance continually return as an index and reminder of, the, of, of how the nation state attempts to both imagine and narrativize itself. Against a backdrop of whiteness, a black specter continually haunts the narrative of the Canadian nation state body and imaginary and call into question its legitimacy. And by so haunting to continually force a revision of the nation state's narrative. The function of blackness here, to borrow a term from Kimberly, M. Kimberly W. Benson in the discussion of John Coltrane's music, is quote, a ghost of revision, forcing us to encounter the terrain of Canada and Canadianness much differently than normative narratives would have us encounter it. I would suggest that this ghost of revision is most acutely felt in the violent antagonism that contemporary protest movements are confronting. But it will also point to how institutions committed to authorizing the white nation, like for example, universities, engage these antagonisms in significant ways too. The debate in Canada about the use of the N-word in university classrooms is just one case among, uh, one, one, it's just one case in point among many others. In Mark Kurlansky's Cod, A Brief History of the Fish That Changed the World, which is a fascinating study of the geopolitics and cultural history of cod, the relationship between colonial Canada and what becomes modern Canada, transatlantic slavery and African bodies and salted cod is laid bare. Since within the European colonial system, the Caribbean was one large plantation of export commodities like sugar, tobacco and cotton, and I quote from Kurlansky, the Caribbean produced almost no food. At first, slaves were, felt, were fed salted beef from England, but New England colonies soon saw the opportunity for salt cod as cheap, salted nutrition. And Kurlansky goes on to detail how Newfoundland and Nova Scotia fisheries quickly became a part of this industry. And one of the things that, that he does that I think is really fascinating is that he looks at the different ways in which salted cod was exported and where it was exported to and what kind of cod. And I wanna give you a couple of quotes from him that I think really speak to um, the ongoing repression and implication of blackness in the life of Canada. So he writes at one point, and I'm gonna quote, though Newfoundland Labrador and Nova Scotia remain almost entirely dependent on fishing. There was little quality and they largely sold to Boston or the Caribbean. The one North American exception was the gasp, where a quality gas core cure was sold to the Mediterranean, end quote. And he details the ways in which the salty cod industry defined itself and its market. And then of the contemporary situation, he makes what I find to be an absolutely 
stunning and fascinating observation. So he wrote, so this book was published in 1997. So 1993, 1997. So he's writing of contemporary Montreal. So he goes, so he writes, modern Montreal is a city of both Caribbean and Mediterranean immigrants. At the Jean Talon market in the north of the city, stores featured badly split small dry salt cards from Nova Scotia and huge well-prepared salt cod from the gas. The Caribbeans consistently buy the Nova Scotian while the gas is sold to Portuguese and Italians. What he's mapping there are the imperial colonial histories through, through cod, um, even in contemporary Canada. I could go on and on about, you know, the double-edged nature of cod, um, but the point here is that the cod that they bought back in Barbados, Jamaica, and Trinidad was so thin and covered in so much salt that so badly split that it becomes still recognizable as a function of the self, even in a place like Montreal, where you can have access to the gas cod, which is thicker, less salted, um, much more carefully cured, and so on. When I say all of this to, to think about the way in which cod extends Canada's geo body beyond its limits into the Caribbean and fashion the historic link between modern Canada and the modern Caribbean, not unlike the banking that I invoked earlier. Such a link has important consequences for the lives of Black people in contemporary Canada. So take for instance, Harold Innes and his understanding of the modern Canadian economy. In Innes's work on the maritime fisheries, he is almost silent on slavery. In an otherwise careful accounting of the ways in which the fisheries became instrumental for the formative moments of a distinctly modern Canadian economy, Innes's silence lends itself easily to the normative narrative of the nation and its modern founding as outside of um, the, 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 the regular formation of the Atlantic world for which slavery was so foundational. But it is exactly the vexed place of Black diasporic people in modernity, and more specifically, the brutal ways in which their bodies and lives were the engines that forged and moved North Atlantic industrialization that remains an unresolved question in the Canadian nation state. I'm going to, I'm getting conscious of time, so I'm gonna cut some of this. Um, so, the histories of commodities and modern forms of governing and the ways in which they have changed the world are important because they illuminate in other ways that we are interconnected socially, culturally, politically, and economically. Our sports sensibilities allow for assessing the ways in which we haunt each other's cultural terrain all the while having to recognize that the haunting is not the same all around. Salted cod fishery is one of the best Canadian examples of this relation to blackness, the diaspora and modernity more general, thus of the extension of Canada's geo body beyond its geographical boundaries. It is critique that positions Canada inside networks of the global and thus diaspora problematics and not as a benefactor now, not merely as a benefactor of recent migrations, a curious observer or an exceptionalist Western interlocutor, as is often as Canada is often produced. So let me leave you then with one last example concerning the recent interventions of the Black Canadian Studies Association and its ongoing tensions with the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. And let me say this, I'm not a member of the Black Canadian Studies Association. I've never been to the, any of their conferences or anything of that sort, but I find this, I find what this means in bringing this, the things that I'm trying to talk about here together really interesting. So, uh oh, sorry, my talk just disappeared, but uh, it's back. Now I just have to find where I was. <laughs> 
Okay. The BSA threatens to open a significant and potentially and potential reordering of black life in the Canadian Academy if its rather modest demands can be heard and acted on beyond a logic of shame and protest as has been the case thus far. In a recent article, one of the co-presidents, Rosalind Hampton of the B BCSA, detailed the history of the association's conversations and negotiations with the Federation. The initial negotiations began when a black student was racially profiled at the 2019 Congress in Vancouver. Since then, the BCSA has canceled their conference twice, in part because they and the Federation have not been able to agree on the conditions that would make their participation on the con that would that would allow them to participate on the conditions that would be less anti-black. So they're not even asking for the eradication of anti-blackness. They just want to be able to participate within a context where the harms of anti-blackness might be somewhat reduced. This year, a number of other organizations and even one university press have withdrawn from, from Congress in support of the BCSA. What we are actually witnessing is how black studies as an insurgent form of study destabilizes white authorizing institutions. The federations are the micro presenting representation of the white nation unravels when black assertions provide another account of what Canada might be. The struggle here is then not one of inclusion, as I am sure the federation's equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization committee will likely suggest, but rather one of the very foundation foundational theoretical or conceptual stakes of the organization and by extension what Canada is. Let me repeat that. The struggle here then is not one of inclusion as I am sure the Federation's Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Decolonization Committee will likely suggest, but rather one of the very foundational theoretical and conceptual stakes of the organization and by extension what Canada is. The Black assertion will not be easily accepted as one that is valid given the repression of Blackness that sits firmly at the root of all that is Canada. Hampton has explored the claim I am making in her book, Black Radicalization and Resistance at an elite university, a study of McGill University that is both about McGill and not about it as she points out in the book. Noting that McGill is a founding institution of Canada, even before confederation, the important point I'm making here in using Hampton's work is Hampton brings to the, comfort, com the conversation with the federation an understanding of the structure of white settler feeling from her own research that wishes well beyond a seat at an unreconstructed table, the normative, mode of contemporary equity, diversity, and inclusion. What I have been doing here through the trace of the historical is to set out a logic for reading Canada that refuses the terms of the frames that Canada has offered up for us to access it and therefore analyze it. I call this reading a, sym a symptomatic reading in so far as I have been offering you multiple examples from the archive of Canada's place in the slave generated and invented Atlantic world that are constitutive of the anti-Black rot that animates Canada, Canadian social and imaginary life and therefore its national consciousness. Sylvia Winter in How We Mistook the Map for the Territory, an essay in which she recounts the struggle for Black studies in the USA, argues that in its institutionalization and thus defeat, it was unable, quote, to complete intellectually that the emancipation that it had inaugurated. Winter argues and points out how liberal humanism and partial induct induction into the ethno class of the West undermined and led to confusing the territory for the map. For example, she writes, black studies became, quote, the re-territorialized and ethnocized African-American studies, right? A subgroup within the national order as opposed to something much larger. I'm suggesting that EDI works and functions in a similar fashion. 
to re-territorialize more radical Black demands while leaving the map still in the hands of the Western bourgeois biocentric human, one that the Black can never enter. The Middle Passage, of which Canada has entirely ejected its national self and imaginary from, haunts the entire enterprise. The racial, national, unconscious of Canada was hold at bay the many tributaries the Middle Passage would insist constitute its identity. Indeed, Canada must articulate a white collective self and fashion a nationhood that represses the very conditions of its existence in the first instance. As I have suggested earlier in other writings before, Canada's colonial history and its practices are not only wed to the geography of the stolen lands it occupies, but the coloniality of Canada exists and it meets the Caribbean Sea. Taken now as more than metaphor and bad geography, the Caribbean Sea in Canada is the bad object choice of Canada's consciousness of its birth. Black people and thus blackness, the fruit of that bad object choice of this nation. And like bad object choices in familiar relations, the centrality of blackness to Canada's national account requires and produces a significant antagonism against blackness and black people. How can this nation account for the, relate, for the relation of blackness to every instance of its own development from the colonial period to the present, from salted cod, rum, bauxite, banking, to miners, to farm workers, to domestics, to the disposable populations in prisons, low wage earners, and father for its brutal postmodern plantation services that keep the wages of whiteness accumulating and the cruel economy going? The psychic life of the nation is anti-Black, and it is that anti-Blackness that others are tutelaged into. Therefore, it is not merely a question of reforms, better policies, and so on. It is a question of reconstruction, a question white settler Canada continually foresaws. What we do with this acknowledgement, if it is acknowledged at all, it's up to us. Thank you. Dr. Walcott, thank you for that brilliant, brilliant talk. As you were speaking, I, um, I just kept feeling this immense gratitude that we're recording this because it's such an incredible talk. And I know that people who weren't able to be here today will benefit so much from being able to see a recorded version. And I also know I'll be using this in my classes in future and I'll be watching it again. Um, thank you. Just, just outstanding. Thank you so much. And uh, I was monitoring the chat a bit while you were speaking and a number of people expressed interest in reading this when it becomes uh, a published piece. And I know that uh, for, for those of the audience, no doubt who were familiar with, their, with your work, they're as excited and moved as ever. And for those who are just becoming exposed to your work, I think that you've developed a, a new audience. So thank you so much. Thank a you. Number, a number of you have, uh, speaking to the audience now, thank you for staying with us. Um, a number of you have put a few questions into the Q&A. For those of you who wish to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A and Dr. Kahika and I will read some of those questions. I don't think we'll have time to ask Dr. Walcott to answer all your questions, but I will capture them so that he is able to read them after, so at least he has a sense of what, you know, what people are responding to in the talk. Dr. Kahiha, I will ask you to raise the first question, please. Absolutely, thank you so much. So, um, Dr. Walcott, there is a question here for you, um, and I'll just read the question as is. So, the attendee would like to thank you for this conversation. Um, that it has been an ongoing issue for them to ponder also, uh, during Grenada's call for independence and the American invasion, Canada had warships in the area and its military a heavy presence in Barbados. And so this attendee would like to know what were they doing in the region? Well, um, you know, East Angsley's work on Canadian foreign policy is tremendously in, enlightening. Um, <clears throat> 
we know that um, if we're looking at, for instance, at Haiti, but I'll come back to Grenada in a second. We know that if we're looking at uh, at Haiti, that Canada has been one of the three, along with the US and France, that have consistently um, interfered in the governance of Haiti, both um, becoming involved as the silent partner in coups. Um, the most recent would have been when Canada conspired with the US and France to basically kidnap then President Aristide um, out of Haiti. In, in 1983, when the US invaded um, Grenada, um, I would believe, I haven't looked into this, but I would believe that um, the Canada's participation and support of that kind of intervention was absolutely a part of, of its foreign policy. You see, the US um, is the overt articulator of no socialism or communism in the Caribbean basin in its backyard. And Canada entirely and totally backs that up. Um, so it's not at all surprising that Canada would have um, troops and equipment, um, military equipment in the region at the time that the US is launching um, an invasion of Grenada. Of course, um, anyone who's really familiar with the Grenada Revolution knows that the, the planes that took off to send the soldiers to invade Grenada took off from Barbados where I was born. I happened to be in Barbados then. Um, but small island, the kinds of planes taken off, you could hear those planes all across the island. It's a sound that has never actually ever left my ears. Um, so Canada is a part of, of not just the long jury of the Atlantic world and what the Atlantic world has produced um, for Black people in the Caribbean and North America and South America and Latin America. Canada is a part of that and its insistence on understanding its own formation as a white formation is in of itself a part of that very particular kind of orientation of whiteness and its um, insistence on um, its own order, authority, and rule within the region and beyond. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Um, the next question I would like to ask you is put forward by Jamie Ryan. Jamie starts with, thank you so much. This has been an amazing talk as always by Professor Walcott. I cannot wait to read The Long Emancipa Emancipation, but I was wondering if your talk today is related to your The Black Aquatic Paper talk. Are they part of the same project? And if they are, could you talk a bit more about this project, if you are comfortable, or about ideas on or around water? water? And they close with, thank you, this talk has been amazing. Yes, definitely. This this talk, as I said at, at the beginning, it takes me, this talk takes me back to all the work that I was doing. I had started to write a book on the impossible dream of Black Canadian studies and abandoned that. And now I'm doing a project on seas and bodies of water um, and the question of Black modernity and freedom. Um, which is a kind of extension of the book that's about to come out next month. And so one of the things that I always write, I always write from where I'm situated. So I've been thinking a lot about, um, of course, not just Canada as a part of the Pacific and not Canada as part of the Atlantic, but because my, my work is concerned with Black people to think about where do these bodies of water that Black people also encounter and engage with, connect with, with Canada, the place that I'm living and writing from. And so this, what you just heard is a really rough attempt to begin to do some of that thinking. Um, so I'm still thinking, I mean, the one thing that, that, that I, I need to work out is the question of the Pacific. Um, 
And I want to do some more work thinking about the St. Lawrence Seaway um, because the St. Lawrence Seaway is absolutely crucial to making sense of Canada's extractive relations in the Caribbean region and elsewhere. But also, because uh, I'm, not, I'm not particularly writing a, um, a work of history, but I'm interested in using the work of historians to limb how to think about the kinds of repressions that shape Eastern Canada. So of course, my gesture to Sylvia Hamilton's work um, is a gesture of that kind of repression that you know, Black Nova Scotians constitute a community before confederation and before they enter confederation. And yet um, Black Nova Scotians um, can be disappeared from the national formation. Um, Black Nova Scotians are not considered to be founding peoples of the nation. Um, in fact, they get reimagined through multiculturalism as opposed to, so, you know, people who've been here for seven or eight generations get reimagined in the nation through a policy from 1971. So that tells you something about the way in which Canada um, constructs Blackness. And so, this, this new project on, on thinking the sea and, and the modernity of the sea for Black people is trying to grapple with that. Yeah, and this is, this is a very early attempt to, to, to do some of that grappling. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kahika, you get to ask the next question, but I couldn't help but think about the, the recent work that you've undertaken with regard to the discourse of multiculturalism in Canada. Right, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I came to this work myself not too long ago, but it has been shocking and surprising for me to understand that multiculturalism, as it was formulated originally, wasn't necessarily something that took into account Blackness. So this becomes, a, you know, it becomes Blackness is an afterthought within the context of multiculturalism, which is uh, perhaps what also um, Dr. Walcott is saying. So, um, and you know, just continuing with that uh, conversation, there was a question here that um, I'm sure one of our participants would like answered by Professor Walcott. So just a bit of context that uh, I love your conceptualization of tributaries and the idea of circulations along these tributaries. Will you please expand on points of accumulations along those tributaries and the damages done? Accumulations and disaccumulations are my interests with this question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. I mean, in, in what I'm exploring now, the accumulation is the, 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 the extracted wealth from the Caribbean um, through banking, through mining, um, through the exportation of, of, of cod, through the importation of rum, um, as those things came to a, be a, a significant element of the project of both building and modernizing the Canadian nation state. And banking, I think, is, is one really important one because the accumulated wealth of Canada's banks, which until fairly recently um, were really um, simply and significantly national institutions. So that our banking in Canada was in, is as important as government. Um, you know, they were not foreign owned, they couldn't be foreign owned and all of these, all of these kinds of things that made them significant founding institutions. Um, the, the accumulations then in terms of the extraction of wealth from the Caribbean, um, the, 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 the manner in which literally black bodies of the Caribbean moved across these geographies to work on farms, um, to, to work as domestics in people's homes and so on, to work in mining at the turn of the 20th century out east as well in Cape Breton and elsewhere, tells a story of, if you will, how Canada also participated in the logics, the, the fungible logics or the fungibility of black people coming from the logics of, plant, of, 
a plantation economy. And so the accumulations are not only economical, even though that's what I stress today, there are also accumulations of the logics of race. And, and those accumulations of the logics and the working of race are what I'm calling the antagonisms because those accumulations understand black people as only being functional in very particular kinds of ways. And one of the functions or one of the things that they can't function as is that they can't function as citizen, not that citizen should be the thing that we aspire to, but the fact that they can't function within the logic of what it means to be Canadian as citizen means then that they become open to the kinds of violences that we witness on our cell phones and our television sets day in and day out. Um, so it, it, it is, think accumulation is a really interesting um, conceptual term as well as a kind of actual practice and something that I should think that I'll have to think a little bit more about. I've been thinking a little bit about accumulations in relationship to reparations, but that's really to undo reparations as simply and merely an economic imperative as I gestured to in the paper as well. Thank you. So much of what constructs whiteness and so-called Canadian identity is grounded in the deliberate forgetting, the, the erasure of anything but the, you know, the myth of what Canada is supposedly all about. I'm curious about what you think the, um, the impact of Black Lives Matter and the, the COVID pandemic may have had on the ability of the Canadian state and uh, all of those of us who are invested in white privilege, um, has there, is there an opportunity for an interruption? Well, yes. And I do think that, I do think that, that there are momentary interruptions. And, and so in the paper, when I gesture to the idea around um, contemporary protest movements. That's that's in part what I'm what I'm speaking to um, BLM by by another formulation. Um, so I think that BLM has been a significant interruption. But what I don't think has happened is um, a reorientation. So BLM and all that it embodies um, the kinds of protest contemporary Black protest movements are still in many ways understood as um, a kind of addition and accommodation within a national frame that doesn't have to change, that doesn't have to rethink its very foundation. So this is why you know, the state and its institutions, whether they're universities, whether it's policing, this is why they can all turn to the logic and the language of EDI because EDI in no way um, requires a reorientation. It takes the formation, the foundation of the formation as essentially fine, except that we will make some adaptations here and of, here and there. And of course, those adaptations can only lead to disappointment. So what's left intact is, you know, what, what um, George Grant said, you know, Anglo and Francophone, Protestant and Catholic, the foundation. And of course, you know, I, I, I used to give this example all the time in my, in, in my teaching to, to students. Um, if you read the, the, the parliamentary record, when Pierre Elliott Trudeau announces multiculturalism in 1991, um, the house, the parliament supports it. In fact, they support it so well that the then opposition leader whose name just went right out of my head, rose to congratulate the liberal government and proceeded to say very clearly that they're happy to have multiculturalism because it in no way undoes the foundational character of who and what Canada is. So, the tremendous momentary interruption that our contemporary protest movements 
have cause for institutions and business as usual has now been recapitulated through a similar move that we call EDI, that we call decolonizing, that we even sometimes call indigenizing, which, you know, all of these, all of these moves, but it keeps intact the foundational claim about um, what Canada is, what those institutions are. And so, um, you know, this can become a cycle, you know, um, for, some, for a while it will demobilize the kind of activism until the disappointment builds and builds and there's yet another eruption. Um, so it is that kind of process that I am arguing um, is in part Canada's own repression of not ever wanting to fully acknowledge the centrality of Black subjection and enslavement to modern Canada, to both colonial and modern Canada. And that goes well beyond having had slavery in this geography. Indeed, thank you so much. Maureen, over to you. Thank you so much. So um, just uh, a question uh, a little bit about Black um, studies in Canada, which is really an extension of just what you were talking about, uh, Professor Walcott. So uh, this is a professor at SFU who, um, who's, who says that, you know, you argue, you know, that if Black studies is to do anything, it must, quote unquote, undo and reconstruct the very terms of knowledge that makes Canada intelligible, end quote. And that it must, so, sorry, it must be something bigger than just adding content, so end quote. So the question is here, how does one convince the institution to hire these undoers and reconstructors when there is a profound fear of meddling with the established structures of power? But yeah, I mean, that's the, con that's the contradiction, the paradox, I should say, for all of us. Um, but of course, you know, as I said in the talk, my thinking is very much um, influenced by, by the work of Stuart Hall. So I, I believe in, in a practice of within and against. So one can be within the university and against it in really useful ways. Um, and again, you know, the kind of logic that I'm trying to articulate here is not one that happens overnight. So each generation is building and putting in place the possibility for making present and making apparent new foundations to reorient our lives. So, you know, others have tried to theorize this through logics of fugitivity, Fred, Moulton and Stefana Harney, um, you know. So what we're talking about really are strategies of in the meantime. <laughs> this is what we must do in the meantime to lay a foundation for a different kind of present and a different kind of future. So it is not um, one in which you're asking an individual to make a kind of sacrifice about when and where they enter and what they do. Because it's the other part of this that, you know, the kind of demand that will reorient how we live together is a demand for collective cohabitation, not for individual heroics, mm. right? And I know it's really, really hard um, if you feel like you're the one person in a department or a school or a faculty who's trying to fight the good fight and being shut down continually to feel as though um, you have to be the individual hero, but we have to resist individual heroics in service of figuring out how to bring others on board, how to work collectively towards a future that is other than the thing that we're living right now. So that might not be a satisfactory answer, but I guess what I, just let me add one more thing there. What I'm trying to get at is that in all of the spaces where we try to do the work to imagine something different from what we have, we should also be simultaneously trying to do it collectively. Um, 
Thank you. Um, one comment more than a question in the uh, Q&A. Can we have a part two of this webinar, please? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. This is a, a, an unbelievably exciting talk and conversation. Let me read a question from one of my colleagues, Michael Hathaway. Thank you so much for this phenomenal talk, he begins. I was struck with your refusal of the notion of inclusion and your insistence on the foundational aspects of blackness in the continual constitution of Canada. In a related way, I am wondering in your reading of Sylvia Winter's piece about mistaking the map for the territory, if you could briefly expand what are some of the most inspiring insights that you take forward for thinking about the possibilities for black studies here. As well, perhaps there are some fundamental differences between the situation in the States and Canada that would foster different kinds of concerns or possibilities for Black studies. Could you please speak to this? Thanks so much. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to all of it, but I'll, I'll try. I mean, I, I think yes and no that there, that there are differences. I mean, of course, we're talking about different populations and different, you know, there, there's some... Canada's population is something like 37, 38 million people, and there's something like 34, 36 million Black people in the U.S. So, so that's Canada's population, right? But I think I think the task for me, what I take from Sylvia Winter's work is, and 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 that particular essay, but her whole entire body of work, um, is the Black Studies was an attempt, an insurgent attempt to reorder what knowledge does and can do. It was an attempt to, if you will, emancipate us from European representations of knowledge, European practices of knowledge as continually reproducing European hierarchy with Europe at the top, you know, to put it that way, Black Studies wanted to engage a project of reinventing the world, a collective project of reinventing the world. And its institutionalization um, interrupted that radical demand to, invent, to reinvent the world. I think in the Canadian context, Black Studies is beginning institutionalized. So it's not, right? Um, it's not. It's not a radical insurgent project from the streets entering the university um, with all of its ragged braggadocio and meaning to overturn the institution. It is being fostered from right inside the institution, which means that this is already um, subjected to the normative way of how the institution works. That in and of itself does not mean that it can't be radical and can't have radical spaces because the point that I was making by turning to the Black Canadian Studies Association is that what they have done inside of the Federation of Humanities and Social Sciences is to demonstrate by making some very modest demands, free access for students and indigenous people and so on, some very modest demands what, what they have been able to, to demonstrate for us is the enormity of the work that has to be done. That, that these very modest demands could only be agreed to after their withdrawal tells you something about the work that must be done, tells you something about what cannot be heard. And so, but, but Black Studies can't enter the university only to do the work of only to do a kind of pedagogical work that is about bringing white people along. Black studies must also have its own conversations, conversations in the meantime that might not have a place for white people. Um, which is to say, not that white people won't participate, but that the conversation would not be one centered on white people. And that in and of itself could open up a range of possibilities for what Black Studies might do in the Canadian context. But you know, the, the, the real issue here is one of understanding how institutionalization can often steal, or if you will, um, truncate the more, ra more radical demands for transformation. And so, you, you know, I come from a school of critical pedagogy and so on. 
where you know the demands for transforming education as a more democratic possibility meets black studies in its demand for a more liberatory world. And so for me, that's the, that's the possibility that black studies holds for the contemporary university in Canada. Thank you so much for that response. I'm going to start wrapping things up uh, as we're approaching 2.30 and with the knowledge that um, this is not a conversation that we're ever going to finish, but it's an incredibly important one. Um, before I close, I just want to remind the attendees that you have an opportunity to attend a, a future lecture. The first inaugural Sonia Lerman lecture is going to be held on um, March 30th at one o'clock. Dr. Angie Hio of the University of Chicago School of Divinity will be delivering a talk titled Fake Churches and False Unification, the Anthropology of Conversion in the Divided Koreas. Um, Sonia Lerman, until her premature death in August 2019, was a deeply valued member of the Sociology and Anthropology Department and a brilliant contributor to fields related to the anthropology of religion and post-socialist studies in the Soviet, in Russia and Eastern Europe. And the, uh, the lecture series is our way of honoring her and uh, remembering her. Dr. Walcott, I cannot thank you enough for your talk today and for the engagement with our questions and, and comments today. It's just been so wonderful to have you. I look forward to seeing this work in published form and keeping up with your work in general. It's had quite an influence on me and I really appreciate your participation today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening. Okay. I look forward to more conversations. Thank you so much. We'll sign off the webinar now and uh, do what we do in our little silos these days. So all the best to everyone. And thank you. Uh, hope to see you back there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.